once you get into some kind of level of repetition, you'll find quite, quite quickly that the practice becomes collaborative. So my practice as a developer is a collaborative design practice with the architects who work with. Business of Architecture UK, episode 7. Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Today I'm super excited to be with the massively inspiring Roger Zologovich who is leading a new generation of independent housing developers in playing a vital and urgent role in providing you know, high quality, innovative and delight, you know, delightful homes to the UK's current you know, housing stock, which I think many of us would agree is woefully undersupplied and very unimaginative. Um, a little bit of background about Roger. In 1975, Roger was the founder of architecture practice CZWG, who I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the work here, a very uh, large practice in London. And his job was actually to have ideas and to find the develop developers. And after a few years, Roger kind of felt very comfortable doing that role and actually felt that he could take on the role of being the developer. And about the age of 35, he acquired some land in North London and actually built a few houses. And the sale of these funded his next move into the world of development. So since then, Roger, has, he's left CZWG and he's operated independently as a developer until 2003 when him and his son Gus, they set up their current venture, Solid Space. And Solid Space is a developer and they transform, you know, they take the urban gap sites and they really kind of unlock potential there, turning them into intelligent, open-planned, light-filled homes that have got a kind of experimental flavour to them. They're individual, they're unique, and they're what Roger calls craft-based making examples of development as art. Um, and some of these housing projects have been completed all across London, Shepherdus Walk in Islington, Centaur Street in Waterloo, Essex Muse in Crystal Palace, and he's worked in collaboration with some great architects, Jean-Paul Jacquard and Tanya Zane, DRMM. You've got Stephen Taylor and Meredith Bowles, uh, and Matthew and Matthew Wood. And these all, you know, all these buildings include the solid space uh, DNA. Um, Roger's also been a member of the Royal Academy Client Committee since 2005 and he's the chair of the Royal Academy Project for the delivery of the Sir David Chipperfield's master plan to transform Burlington Gardens and link it to Burlington House. He's also chaired the Southwark DRP meetings during 2011-2017 and he also chaired the jury at the WAF Singapore in the small projects category in November 2015 and 2016. And Importantly, he's also the author of Shouldn't We All Be Developers, which is a fantastic book which has sparked debate about the role that small and independent developers should play in building new homes that are so desperately required. Now, this book is now available uh, as an ebook on Amazon, and uh, I really hope you enjoy this incredible interview with Roger. It really is a, a wealth of wisdom uh, and inspiration here for all architects who are looking to tread that path and really use their architectural knowledge in becoming developers and uh, entrepreneurs. So welcome Roger. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here and just kind of you know really curious like what what was it that made you become the transition to a developer? Well, you're you're asking me to cast my mind back a fair <laughs> number of years, um, but uh, you know that's that's uh, they always say old men have memories. So <laughs> that, uh, I I can recall it very well. Um, I, I wasn't, um, although I was qualified as an architect and had always really from a very young age been interested in the process of the development side of architecture, mm. um, and I remember. Um, even when I was younger, my grandfather, uh, I came from a tradition of an architectural, tradi uh, a development tradition. Um, he'd, he'd worked with uh, Oscar Deutsch, and Oscar Deutsch built the Odeon chain. Right. In fact, the Oscar Deutsch stands for, or well, Odeon stands for Oscar Deutsch entertains our nation. <laughs> Uh, so this is now going back into the 30s and my grandfather at that stage built all the uh, developments you see around the Odeon. So in the Odeon cinemas you look around you see sort of shops and, right. and uh, apartments and stuff around the Odeons. 
And he, as a, as a small child, I remember him regaling me with these um, stories of, of development. So the kind of notion, the kind of excitement for me was that from a very early age, I recognized that there were kind of certain legal instruments associated, long leases, and yeah. shit selling interests, and all of that became quite intriguing. And yeah, so, you had a bit of the kind of the economic yeah, I had vocabulary. A kind of, I had all that in my head. I even yeah. had it in my head when I went to the AA, and uh, this was a kind of surprising thing because people at the AA didn't really go in for that. In fact, I think that I was one of the only people at the AA actually made profit out of the carnival, <laughs> uh, which is a kind of a, a, an interesting story. But it taught me something. It taught me something about currency. Mm. Um, in those days, we were only allowed to. Um, it was a kind of. It was. Do we just managed to persuade the printers to print more tickets than? were particularly authorised, in which case it was a very successful carnival that made money for the AA. So it was a surprise to everybody. Not to myself, of course, because... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was fun. And moving on, uh, when we set up at CZWG, we were four guys in our 20s, um, uh, straight out of the AA, all, all colleagues. And we found that the way we were getting work, we had no patronage as such. The way we were getting work was that we were able to um, uh, bring sites to our clients, find sites in those days, or I was able to find sites, mm. introduce the site, and what we got out of it was the architecture. Yeah. And I, we did this and built the practice very successfully over a, over a 10-year period. At the end of it, I kind of got rather bored by the fact that Every time I went to a client, they would make an awful lot of money. It wasn't so much that, but also worse still was that they would have a, an estate agent in tow who would then tell them, oh, you can't do that, you can't do this, you mm. can't do the other. And I would say, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. And they said, well, what do you know? You're only the architect. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I kind of decided I, I didn't have any money myself, so I had to dis find a way of what I call uh, throwing the double six. So lots of times I looked at sites and da 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 everything else, and my double six was very simply is that I managed to sell a site before I'd bought it. Right. Or okay. I had actually bought it, but I hadn't actually had to pay for it. So when I managed to sell the site, um, I I was able to use the sale of the site to pay for the purchase, and I and and I promise you, I, I it felt like a magical moment. I mean, I I may I remember I think. I bought the site for 87000 and sold it for 157000 There wasn't a huge amount of money, but mm. I felt so rich. Yeah. Unbelievably rich. <laughs> I, I, we, my wife and I went out celebrating. We went to some hotel. It wasn't a very great celebration, but we did feel good. Yeah. And I suppose that's, that's the moment. You then have to take that money and you have to then invest it in the next set of projects. And all the time, as far as I've been concerned, the only thing that I've been interested in doing is using my imagination as an architect to find ways of adding value. Mm. One of the things I found quite interesting going back to my work at the AA is I had a tutor there called Santa Raymond, who's sadly now dead. But she, uh, when I was in my second year there, yeah. um, I said, Santa, I just don't understand. I, I think we were doing some terrace house project, which was a standard fair for architectural uh, students at the time. And she said, well, I said, I, how do I know whether this is profitable? She said, well, I've got a friend of mine and I'll bring something in for you. And so she, she gave me my first appraisal or his first appraisal. And suddenly I found that there was, a, there was something about this development appraisal, about this measurement of costs and values and a determination. And then, of course, this is very early days when computers came along. Mm. I mean, you won't know this because you're sort of Excel, but there, there, was a, there was a predecessor to Excel called Multiplan. And uh, in those days, everybody smoked. And you kind of, you literally had to put a, you had to put a calculation in the machine and you'd sort of have to st have, a, have a cigarette break <laughs> while the machine was calculating what was happening. <laughs> It was that slow. <laughs> However, it was, as far as we're concerned, completely revolutionary because this was uh, a, a computer program that enabled us to ask the what if. Yeah. And I think it, I think at some point in this, you, you said that what's important, I think, for all, all of us to understand from an architect's perspective is that actually we have no skills as far as 
the issues of viability and the risks associated with the project. So we have all the skills we need in terms of imagination. We have all the skills we need in terms of having a vision. So we can stand in front of a site and you know, yeah. you can imagine it all. And I, I, I've, always, I've always said that I can't possibly even consider buying a site without driving past or looking at it or standing there. Yeah. These days I stand there and I sketch or I take it home or I, get the drawings and start to immediately plot out the concept of what's got to be built. And when you think about it, what we're doing is actually looking at the development of volume mm. that emerges. And this is why I'm a fanatic about small sites. Yeah. Because I believe that where you deal with a small site, it's like a kind of really intriguing bit of a jigsaw puzzle where so much else is already there. And what you're saying is there already is the tree on that corner. Mm. There already is a window from that woman across the road that's overlooking at it. There's already a roof height that's been established on, on, the, on the south elevation. There's already an elevation to the north. How do you kind of configure all that to take a kind of beautiful, in a way, poetic subdivision? And I think that quite often with me, with architecture, some people, I suppose, I learned quite early on that I wasn't going to be Corbusier. I was not, I was not going to be a star architect. It just was, I wasn't cut out for it. I'd recognized it. I recognized it in others. I recognized it in people I knew, people I'd associated with the AA, and I admired it, and I yeah. still do. I've been admired, I've admired it all my life. Mm. But what I found I was good at was something which was always frowned upon by my fellow architects is called the plan man. And a plan man is, I mean, I think it's, unfortunately, I think it's unfair that we are frowned on, but uh, plan men are very important because a good plan is a, an essential part of how you understand the program of a building yeah. e evaluates. So that was kind of my, my fascination. Amazing. And it's quite interesting what you're, what you're saying, that how we've got all these different skills as architects to imagine the site, but perhaps we lack the kind of economic... Um, vocabulary and understanding and that's kind of totally void in our yeah i think it, i think it, i agree and i think it's a it's a huge missing element if you like in our educational process yeah and i think that um i'm always surprised that um architectural students who've invested all this money and come out of architecture qualified with a huge bill yeah do not actually sue the riba <laughs> Uh, and say, and the reason, the case that I would bring against the RIBA is that my architectural <laughs> education has not made me fit for practice. Yeah. So it's not fit for purpose. Yeah. Because if I can't debate with my clients how I can add value and demonstrate how can I add value, how can I then the, myself get rewarded relative to that value? And I, uh, to be honest, I'm not and I don't think any architect is a carpet salesman. Yeah. Forgive me if I'm not being, I'm using carpet salesman as kind of generated. In other words, anybody that kind of sells something will always, a carpet salesman is always going to try and persuade you that the cheapest product, you want to get that one a bit more expensive. And yeah. in the end, you always end up by saying, oh, there's a nice cheap carpet. Yeah, I think I'll have that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... I think that architecture has become debased in that way. Mm. So that, okay, the, the architecture now stands in two camps. But the architect, if you, if as an architect, all you ever do is chase price or cost, not value, and you don't have a mechanism for determining value, then how can you actually raise the expectation or the ambition of your architecture? Mm. So that was, to my mind, the reason I went into development. Yeah, my reason for going into development was actually for me a form of practice. And how how would you how would you differentiate between cost and value? Uh, uh, when you're you, 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 the, the development appraisal, which I discuss with you, is the essential tool. Yeah. So as a developer, what you're doing is you are weirdly paying for everything. Mm. So every cost, every item of cost is what you know because you write a check for it. Yeah. So when the, when, the, when the engineer comes along, when the architect comes along, when the contractor comes along, when the consultant comes along, whether it's the back consultant, whether, whether it's the sound consultant, they're all, in, they're all coming into you and yet asking you to open your checkbook and, and write a check. So at the end of it, 
a development appraisal is not really a lot different to a Sainsbury's bill. <laughs> right? Yeah. There's a there's a whole lot of expenditure down one side, and you just add it all up, right at the bottom, and you come down to a total. Mm. The difference between a Sainsbury's bill is, in this case, you're then selling the thing that you've made. Yeah. So the value comes in is what do you sell it for? Yeah. And hopefully, in development terms, a successful development is one where you sell it for more than you built. Yeah. An unsuccessful development is one where you sell it for less. And the difficulty for us is that as a developer, you're having to make judgments. My developments really are fairly slow. Other people are, are smarter and quicker than me, but I tend to be, nothing happens in less than three years. Most of our projects are five years or right. longer. So I have to make a decision based upon what the market's going to be like in five years' time, which is quite a kind of, is, is, is almost perhaps the most thoughtful part of the development process because you have to understand you know if i'm in the office market what's the office is going to be like mm. if i'm in the residential market what size what prices what's the values that are going to be attributable you have to kind of be able to be outside the hype in a in a way so not following everybody but doing what you know doing it what you believe in to be correct doing whatever you need to do in terms of analyzing that yeah so that you can then your development appraisal is literally doing those two things it's looking at the costs on one side and again on the cost you have to be realistic and make sure that you've covered your contingencies that if the building goes over time you're going to negotiate your extension of time claim etc etc also you know if the if if the market goes up which if it does go up, then you, then sometimes the demands for specification increases, so yeah. your costs increase. And then the other side, you have to look at what the what the values are, and then you look at the two things, and you you start modelling those two things together, and that's the essence of a development appraisal, and that's the tool. And I think that my advice to architects is very simple: is that, as I said, I think we have the imagination, we have those skills, we understand the planning. We understand, we recognize even the really lovely sites. Yeah. These days I can't buy a site because too many architects are out there outbidding me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great for us all. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that it's happened like that. And, but the, the thing we have to remember is that we have to understand the risk profile. And, you, and there are, in development, there are three elements of risk or three areas of risk. The first is the planning risk. Yep. The second is the construction risk. Mm -hmm. And the third is the market risk. And I think it, you keep it simple like that. It's not really complicated. Yeah. So you look first at the planning. So you say, if I'm buying this site without planning, uh, what am I sure that I'm going to get a consent for it? What am I going to get a consent for it? What will be my consent as the minimum I'd likely to get? What's the maximum I'd like to get? You model both of those. If I'm looking at them, my construction costs, what are my construction costs? What are the additional costs? Because it's not construction costs, it's all the associated costs that go with the construction. Do I have contaminated ground and land there? Uh, yeah. Contaminated soil, which I'm going to have to take off site. Do I have a special requirement for acoustics? Do I have a special requirement for, for fire or sound insulation? Are those going to cost me more money? Is there a problem with, is there a risk associated with an existing building with the asbestos? Mm. Have I evaluated all those costs properly? And quite often we say, oh, well, I've got a brilliant QS. Well, I haven't yet found one, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they do exist. And if any QS is listening to this, you know, <laughs> they feel they want to come forward, please do. And the reason, in a way, in a funny way, why, why you, uh, the difference between a, a QS, which is looking at the construction, is they're not looking at the developer's position. Yeah. So from a developer, I've got to look at all the external costs. I've got to look at things like the professional fees. I've got to things, things like time delay, because money is costs. I've got to raise finance and I've got to actually evaluate how long I'm going to borrow money for and the banks are going to want to know when I'm going to get it, pay that money back. So all these externalities are built into what I call the risks associated with construction. Yeah. They're all driven from that construction model. And then the final and the third part of that is the is the market. Mm. And the market, uh, well, what is the market on the way down? Is the mar market on the way up? I think in the moment we are in London, in a very difficult situation in the market because uh, housing prices are coming down to a small extent, but with house co with construction costs going up because of the effect of the exchange rate and so much of our stuff is coming in from Europe, 
there's a danger that our costs are going up and our and end sales are going down, which is a really difficult situation. And at the moment, the land price, we, we spend a lot of time watching land prices, yeah. and land prices are not falling to the, to the same situation as I believe they should do. Yeah. And how do you go about acquiring a site? Well, there's never any. I mean, there's lots of... Um, I would say my only advice I can give you is is you acquire a site by by stalking it. Right. <laughs> And you stalk it because you kind of spot it as an opportunity. And then you try and get as close to it as you can, as close to the owner, you talk to people. Yeah, It's never an easy, you know, they're, 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 there's no magic formula about buying sites. Everybody, you're always in competition with loads of other people. And if you're thoughtful and you're careful, which you are because you're a professional, you're probably, in a way, always going to find it difficult to pay the same money as somebody who's not being thoughtful because in their development appraisal, they won't have, in the cost side of that, the same things that you've put into it, yeah. which means that they will yeah. end up by... They will imagine that the, the building could be sold for more, they get more flats in it, they'll be smaller, they'll be nastier, <laughs> they won't spend the money on the architecture or the build, and therefore you, ha you will have difficulty in competing... Uh, with that uh, land in the first place. And how do you go about raising the finance? Do you do, you do joint ventures or work with sort of equity groups? Or well, I, I, you, you're, you're, you, you do need your own equity. Yeah. And if you, you can do joint ventures, but it's always good to have your own equity. Yeah. And if you have your own equity, the, the, the finance market is very well disciplined. Mm. So um, you have to understand that there's a separation between debt and equity. And debt is... Um, it is the, what's called the senior debt, which is available to you through banks and finance houses, and that's pretty standard. I mean, if you want to start, if you want to borrow sixty or sixty-five percent of the project uh, development value, then it's quite kind of it's within the realms of possibility. Mm. Once you want to borrow ninety percent of the of the um, project value then effectively it becomes much more difficult then you have to have mezzanine equity or have to have equity providers so i think just keep it simple try and get yourself your family and friends to get you enough money or your first deals or you retain it enough money to give you the equity to put your stake that equity is best placed straight into the land right so if you can right okay. if you buy your if you buy your land because it's very hard to raise finance on a site which doesn't have a planning consent and hasn't got a hasn't got a development established on it. So, as a, as a young developer, as a young entrepreneur, if you can pull together your own funds to go mm. off and buy that site, and then you spend the time designing what you need, get your planning consent, get your QS reports on the construction, put your viability statement together, get assessments from your uh, agents on the selling price and once you put that together as a clear picture then the funders the uh, people who lend you the money become much more comfortable right. they think then they're comfortable you've gained the credibility in their mind uh, that actually you can you can deliver because anybody that's lending you money actually does not want although they have a security over the project they don't want that project back they just want their money back <laughs> And of course, their interest and their charges on top of it. Yeah, yeah, amazing, very, very fascinating. And how does Solid Space? What's the kind of your sort of magic ingredient that you bring to unlock these kind of challenging sites? Well, um, and do you, do you often find that you're you're getting sites that often other developers will overlook because of just out of the sheer lack of imagination? Well, I or? think I think there w there has been that in the past, but I think the 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 trouble in the times we're living now is that, the, the, that every site that you go for has already got a planning consent in place. Yeah. Or, uh, and so what you're really saying is, can I improve on that? And what you're really saying, if you go, can I improve on it? Can I make a better project? Mm. Uh, you know, I, as I said, I, I, I think there are, I think the market shifts. There are times I've, I've had, I've been in this business for a long time. Mm. And there's times when, uh, there's been times of really frustrating where there's been wonderful sites out there, but I haven't had the money to buy them. <laughs> yeah. And there's other times when there's no sites out there and I have got the money to buy them. So it's kind of, all I can say is you, you, you just have to, if you think about it, if you, if you think about any city that you know, whether it's London or Bristol or Birmingham, 
And if you uh, use your foot, your shoe leather, um, I'm not a big cyclist, I guess I, I wouldn't want to do this on a bicycle. <laughs> I have done it in a car, which is also quite good. But if you just use your shoe leather and walk around the sides and keep your eyes open, you spot the opportunities. Mm. And I used to say when I was teaching, I used to call these people, I used to call these soft sights. And people said, what do you mean by a soft sight? I said, well, a soft sight, I, I'm, here I'm, I'm standing there opposite looking at a soft sight. That's a sight which I think is capable of development. Mm. So these are kind of like holes in the infrastructure of the city. So there might be a kind of garage or there might be a, a, a two-story building or a single-story building amongst other buildings which mm. are four-story. I mean, personally, I think the city needs will densify, will go up. I don't think it needs to go up as towers. Yeah. I think it needs to go up, you know, two-story buildings need to be six-story buildings. And I think that's absolutely fine. I don't think, I think it's absurd that we're building downwards. We should be building upwards. So, so in London, we have a kind of, well, in the, in the UK, we have a wonderful uh, grid arrangement of our sites. And that grid arrangement, people say, well, we don't have grids. We have streets and neighborhoods. Yes, but what I'm saying by grid is that we have party walls. So the grid to me is the party wall. So I, I, uh, I remember very well that that um, when I started out in my career, before digitized maps, we used to have a, a, a we used to buy uh, an ordnance survey sheet for every site we were looking at. And these were quite expensive, but we used to have a fantastic collection yeah. of ordnance survey maps. And I would pour over these. I'd mm. actually, you know, almost, well, in those days I had good sites, so I didn't need a magnifying glass. But you'd, and you'd kind of see, you'd, you'd, you'd read this pattern of the city through the through the ordnance survey map through which is describing the plot definition and you see those opportunities that emerge out of that out of those plots brilliant and and what's the sort of I'm talking here about the kind of the solid space dna what well, well, in in solid spaces i think you you what we discovered early on and you you referred to our building in Central Street and it's really it goes way back even before that right. because when I was a, um, an architect learning my trade um, the early stages of my career were all based around the London Terraced House mm. and so my first when I was your sort of age I, I, I was my, my clients were people who had bought terrace houses and wanted to kind of knock them about, make them into flats, whatever it happened to be. And so I kind of very early on realized the sectional connection. I told you I was a plan man. But yeah. I was also a plan and section man because the section is the important part. You can't make a plan work unless you understand the section. And that section then enabled me to understand how this, the wonders of the terrace house, which is this half level extension. So all these terrace houses that I was looking at, which you come in at one level, then you go up a few stairs and then you come to the, go up or down into the back extension. And this, this was very rewarding because it actually has a kind of mechanism of opening up the volume. So all I did with solid space was kind of reinvent the terrace house, but bring the staircase into the center of the house. So solid space is just a, rec a recognition that a half level relationship mm. is a really interesting one. And the reason why a half level relationship is interesting is because your eye level is always above the halfway point. Yeah. So even a small chap like me, I still have an eye level at about 1.6 meters, you know, 1.7. Whereas if you split the on a 2.8, you've got a, a half level, which is 1.4. So I think the interesting thing is about the solid space is that we then realize that contemporary living uh, is arranged in these three elements, and we call them uh, eat, live, work. And basically this is, obviously there's, other, and, and why do we bring those spaces together? Because those are the social spaces in the home. Mm. Uh, our bedrooms are kind of private. They're not part of that social space. But the eat, live, work is where we, we, we eat, we live, and we work. And that's what we do in every part of our life. And I found that if we were to experiment with these with three levels, so you enter at the mid-level, you drop down half a level and rise half mm. a level, uh, you then created a void around the staircase or a void that you actually made, which made a sense of volume, which was really intriguing. Yeah. And so I found that you had a kind of, it was like as if we turbo, turbocharged our space. Yeah. So coming back to this notion that 
we're looking at um, leftover spaces, we're looking at small spaces, we're constrained by the planning. So we've all got somebody, we've always like got a, a light angle, a straight jacket that's pushing you in this way or the other. This mechanism of using a split level suddenly ena enabled me to optimize the mm. volume at the same time giving my occupiers a wonderful sense of space, much bigger than they had imagined was possible or they thought when they walked through the front door. Mm. So, Roger, what's, what's the importance of gap site development? In uh, well, I, uh, I, I'm a great believer in gap site development. I think, it's a, I think um, we talk a lot about the um, problems of housing. We talk about the lots of problems of uh, development in the cities. Mm. And um, I think we've, uh, over various uh, government um, initiatives, we've ended up by uh, creating a, a rather warped development environment which mm. is dominated by the large house builders or dominated by the large developers. Yeah. And um, I think we, we're we missing out on the opportunities that exist in uh, the 21st century for the redevelopment of parts of our cities, Yeah. Um, which are is more piecemeal mm. and is more uh, independent, is, is small scale. Yeah. And that small scale does not suit those large players. And this is what I think is. Yet I think it, I think those land parcels represent a huge resource mm. uh, for really intelligent and imaginative redevelopment. Yeah. And I think this is one of the places that the architectural world can play a much bigger part, because in a sense, they the imagination that an architect brings mm. uh, is the imagination which helps unlock that sort of site. Yeah. So we're talking about sites which may be currently occupied by single-story buildings close to the heart of the cities yeah. um, and actually are capable of their own independent development. Yeah. That's the key to this. It's the notion that they're alongside, uh, if you like, the big-scale corporate player. Yeah. We're wanting to try and foster uh, uh, a whole new web of independent players mm. who can work at this kind of fine grain it's a bit like the it's kind of filling in the yeah it's building it's like um uh what happens if you like if you it, that's happened to uh bakery You're right you know the 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 artisan baker uh, has taken on the the the, the big scale supermarket baker mm. uh and and given us all a taste for something more exciting in the breads that we eat because we like what it is that they bake. Yeah. And I think that in, in a, I'm not using the word, I don't want to use the word artisan, I really want to use the word independent developer. Yeah. But in a way, it's, it's somebody that actually is able to respond to the particularity of the site they're developing. So when you when you look when we look at um, at uh, development of backland or gap sites, we're standing there. We're literally kind of walking the course, mm. seeing what the size of the of the site of the building is that's next door, where the sun comes, whether there's a tree, bringing all those architectural, and you're bringing all that kind of that architectural sensitivity. Uh, you're thinking of this as a volume, mm. as a notion of a complete of, of an understood volume. That volume is respectful of the community in which you're resting. So yeah. that volume is, you know, you, you're 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 looking at how high one wall can be and how high the next wall can be, and where the kind of level of the roofscape would be joining those together. And I think that's a really interesting. It's much more of a Japanese way yeah. of building. Uh, in a way, you're you're thinking three dimensionally in the grid of the city, and uh, in, and inserting into that grid mm. a piece of development volume. Yeah. Now, I think that that's the point that the planning should stop. Yeah. So I think that you should have a, a special planning policy for this these kind of sites, which enable the planners to control what that volume is. Uh, to maybe control what the materials are that you make that volume out as it shows in the street. Yeah. Fenestration. But have no control over what happens inside the building. Yeah. And that there is a freedom and a flexibility. So if you want to operate that as workspace, if you want to operate, if you want to live in it, if you want to have a school there, it is just a kind of, if you like, it's you're trying to remake higher density in the city 
to continue continue the sustainability and each mm. building then can have a kind of quirkiness and a freedom that is imposed by the architect and the architect themselves have to get better then at, at leading that as effectively the developer yeah learning how they can uh, they can add to their own skill base not just uh, from uh, the skills that they already know in terms of planning and 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 building design, mm. but also the skills that we need to add, which is valuation and funding and yeah, the, the risks appraisal. associated with development. But I think this 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 the, the there I think the city is 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 peppered with these opportunities. Yeah, they become kind of windfall sites, if you like, in the capacity of the city, and it, in and I think. Once we start to look at it with any kind of real eyes, at the moment they've been forgotten, they've been mm. left behind, they've been ignored, they don't appear on the statistics. Uh, they're not something that um, anybody kind of takes very seriously. Yeah. They're certainly not uh, the mayor's authority does, and although the mayor's authority should, and I think they are taking a bit more care about um, small site development. Mm. So I, I think this is a real opportunity for the... Uh, the architectural profession. Yeah, and, and and like you said, what what do you think makes a good developer? Like from the architect moving over to becoming to becoming the client, essentially. Um, and what I, and what are the pitfalls you think that architects might end up kind of? Well, uh, I think the architect the pit, the main pitfalls are that architects are not trained in in risk assessment. Yeah. And uh, in the development process, uh, it, it, you're a successful developer mm. is really somebody that manages their risk successfully. So what architects come with is an, an extraordinary ability to visualize the city in three dimensions. And that is something that there is unique to them. Yeah. Nobody else has that ability to really map or visualize that three dimensional, mm. conceive of a three dimensional form. That's that's kind of we don't want to be in our own echo chamber and appraise ourselves too much for that. That's a very good <laughs> tactic. Now let's put that behind us and say what are the downsides? Yeah. The downsides: if you spend too much money on the site, if you spend too much money on the construction, if you don't understand who the customer is for the space, if you're not, if you don't do enough research into understanding what this is, what they're going to pay, mm. then however brilliant your conception of what that space is going to be you're going to go bust yeah so yeah. i want to i don't want you to go bust i want you to make money and and be successful and and to be successful you then have to take on in a really serious way those skills that you don't have as an architect and those are skills of of evaluating and measuring risk and how are those how are those learned where do we get them from um they learn in a way, obviously through uh, through experience. Yep. But um, there are uh, uh, educational programs that are available. There's a, there's a lot of courses that are available. Mm. But predominantly, what's important in terms of determining risk, stand back from it, mm. and you try and map for yourself the hurdles that might come about from your burst of vision when you stand there looking at the site to the to the moment when you come to finish your finished unit and sell them and you realize that actually the legal framework of any kind of legal transfer of that land let's say to make it simple you're selling that you're you're buying a site yeah you're acquiring that legal title that freehold title you're obtaining a planning consent and you're going to divide it into six units. Yep. At this stage, let's forget what the units, whether they're offices or mixture or whatever it is, they're six units. Uh, and at the end of that process, you need to find six purchasers. Okay, so simply speaking, you have to then find your six purchasers. So you say, well, that's not a big problem. I can go to an estate agent and they can mark, help me market it. Well, that may be so, but if they're quirky, you've got to establish the values for them. Mm. Where the risks lie is 
you bought this site, which you thought was very nice, and then you found that there was uh, contamination in the ground. How did you deal with that contamination? Did you have the right certification in terms of whether you remove that to be able to demonstrate to the buyer that actually that works? Yeah. What about all the adjacent owners? Have you done the party wall agreements with each of them to clarify that that's satisfied? What about the planning consent? Did you satisfy the small print of the conditions? Have you varied the drawings? Have you um, met the BRIAM requirements? Have you met the uh, building uh, regulation requirements? Are you able to certify that? Because as soon as you come to sell something, on the other side, the solicitors of the, of the purchaser acting for the mortgage or will ask you all those sorts of questions. Mm. So suddenly, this sounds like a depressing moment, <laughs> but in reality, this takes a period of time, and it isn't depressing. It's the reality that you, yeah. are, you are selling, uh, you are entering into uh, a piece of real estate, and real estate itself is governed by... Uh, a whole series of laws of ownership mm. and therefore the risks are uh, the ability for you to offer clear title as you go down the line and therefore the risks are how much that costs you to give you that clear title what are you going to do if your building costs uh, if the g contractor comes back to you and says I can't build it at the price I said I was going to do or the contractor goes bust or what are you going to do when uh, you suddenly come up with a better idea. Yeah. Architects have this wonderful, invariable quality where they say okay, they, have a, they have a bath, <laughs> uh, they go for a walk on the park, yeah, sit they, on the uh, they sit on the wherever, wherever, whatever it is. <laughs> oh, do you know what? I've come up with this. I just got this blinding idea. Yeah. Meanwhile, that blinding idea happened after you'd submitted the planning application, after you'd submitted the pre app, and suddenly all of your financial information. So I have to say to you, when you have a blinding idea, my best advice is leave it to the next project. <laughs> that's, but that's really interesting. Is, do you ever find that, like, w uh, that there's a conflict between the architectural skills and the development skills, and like a kind of almost like a like a sort of split personality of which identity needs to win, or do they, or can they work harmoniously, or is it a, a situation where actually, like, perhaps it's sometimes better where you just wear one hat? And perhaps you collaborate with an architect to develop your ideas. Well, uh, yeah, it, it, that's a very interesting question. I mean, I found uh, in my career, I was an architect and I, I, I worked as an architect for 10 years of my professional career yeah. after finishing. And I built a, uh, with, with partners, I built up an architectural practice. And um, towards the end of that 10 years, I started to do development on my own right, sort of running alongside. And I found that, that I was being, that was kind of, the two things were not sitting comfortably, you know, I felt I was, I was in a way, um, I was, it, 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 there was conflicts. Yeah. And, and I'd made a decision to change my career from being an architect into being a developer. Now that was, um, you know, in 1986, so it's actually, you know, uh, some years ago. So I do agree with you that I think you end up, being a developer is different to being an architect. I think some developers are successful in they are their own architects or when they come to an architectural. And I think you can do that at a relatively small scale. Mm. I think once you get into some kind of level of repetition, you'll find quite, quite quickly that you, you find, uh, the practice becomes collaborative. So my practice as a developer is a collaborative design practice right. with the architects I work with. Right, and they might say I might say it's collaborative. They might say, as usual, he's interfering. <laughs> so you have architects actually employed working for you in your in your team, and you also work with other architects as as a as a sort of collaborative. Uh, yeah, I do. We do have architects here working in our team, and and that really enables us to. Um, uh, uh, work through the, the sheer number and volume of projects that uh, never get uh, I mean as, as a developer when we're acquiring land um, in these gap sites of which I'm talking yeah. of course we're not alone everybody wants to acquire a piece of land it's never uh, you know whatever the smallest most uh, unattractive piece of land 
uh, you go into an auction room and you'll find six other hands are up already up in the room. And so if you're going to buy it, you're going to buy it in competition to them. And so when you're doing that acquisition, uh, it's important that you have your uh, fully understood idea of what that scheme is so that you're able to appraise it. You can only appraise it when you know what the scheme is you can build and you can assess what the floor areas are and you can look at what the bill costs are and what the time period is, what the interest pay payments are, and what the end values. So as a consequence of that, we need to churn over a lot of projects which never see the light of day right okay. so we invest in them but they're what we're investing is uh, like soft time well it's expensive but we're investing our own time to checking out how what these projects are and what their projects could be some projects then we we won't bid on them because they we can't meet what the guideline is or some projects we will bid and will be unsuccessful yeah and some will bid be successful but it there's there's um, be you know don't don't be misunderstood. There there is a there's a lot of competition for land, mm -hmm. huge amount of competition, and that's because there's a, a lot of money um, chasing the market. If it, in my situation right now, uh, not my situation, but the market situation yeah. as I assess it, is a very difficult one. Mm. Um, uh, bill costs are, are going up. Um, uh, uh, high construction costs. Um, Regulation costs are going up. Regulations are becoming more expensive. The CIL is coming in, other kind of costs. Uh, end sales prices, particularly on residential, is falling. Yeah. Uh, and that that should have the effect of reducing the value of the land that's coming into the open market. And so we monitor all the time uh, what's coming into the marketplace. And actually, at the moment, land is not falling. So we're not buying because... We're saying actually, it's not, it's there's not the wrong possible. time to buy, yeah. and that land will eventually fall. But the problem it, that we have is that the market has got too much kind of hot money already there, mm. and there are people that aren't take aren't being quite as careful as we are, and they're actually still coming and buying, and and so there'll be a lag. It might be twelve months before the market will suddenly adjust itself yeah. to that new situation. So it's very important for us to monitor that quite carefully. And how do you do that? How how are your what kind of systems do you have in place to sort of be monor monitoring that or speculating uh, about the? Well, it, 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 there's there's a, uh, the, the simple tool we always use is the same tools we use in everything, which is the which is the development appraisal. Yeah. And I basically say to people when they ask me about a development appraisal, I say, well, it's it's really a development appraisal. If you go to uh, uh, Sainsbury's shopping. Uh, you know, with your partner or uh, whatever, and you come back and you've spent a hundred quid or one hundred and fifty quid, and you come back and you have a, you end up with a long piece of paper, and on that piece of paper it tells you all the things that you bought. <laughs> you can't believe you came to that money, but somehow they did. Yeah, uh, a development appraisal is exactly the same, except the sums of money. There's the same number of lines occur, but those lines will be your consultant ecologist, your consultant traffic, your architect, your engineers, your construction costs, your uh, uh, warranties, your insurance costs. So at the end of it, you'll end up with your Sainsbury bill and you'll end up with a ton of sum. Mm. And what you're hoping is at the top of that, above the Sainsbury's bill, there there is is your sales and that should be more than you ending up with paying. Yeah. Right? But it's as simple as that. Yeah. I mean, I'm making it sound very simple, but actually... That's the kind of mechanism. So there's nothing to be there's nothing to be frightened about a development mm. appraisal. There are a development appraisal is simply a financial map, an Excel spreadsheet, which is mapping all of the costs, all of the forecast costs, and uh, looking at what the forecast income is. Mm. And then you're looking at the difference between your forecast costs and your forecast income. And you should be looking at a margin there of at least 20%. Yeah. And the reason you're looking for the margin of 20%, not because you want to become immensely rich, but that margin is really your contingency yeah, it's like a safety. in case the safety valve, in case things go wrong, it takes you longer to, to let or longer to sell or the market falls or building costs go up or whatever it is. Mm. So th this, it's, this is really, really fascinating. And I kind of, every time I... 
think about this i'm often kind of thought well, why on earth did we not learn this at university or why is why is this a piece that's missing in our architectural education because actually it's it empowers the architect a lot to be able to be this kind of literate in the uh, financial aspects of a building and to have that kind of use that the, what we're, the skills that we're very good at like you were saying that sort of three-dimensional and visionary skills but also apply that kind of entrepreneurially so we can start thinking about an end market and an end user but this is a conversation that perhaps is not you know it's it's lacking in in our in the education and actually it, it's something that could unlock a lot of well it, the impact that it could have on the built environment as a whole um could be you know massively beneficial and provide a lot of um, you know new high quality housing i th i think it's an i think it's an extremely good point um i've um Laboured long and hard. <laughs> I've represented to the RIBA many times over many years. That this should form part of the curriculum. Uh, I think it's a. I think it's a. I think there's an issue of fashion involved in architectural education, and I think uh, architectural education is a bit of a fraud. Um, and I th and what I mean by that is that there's a kind of myth in the, mm. in the in the educational sphere that suddenly all these people that are learning architecture are going to become master builders. Now, why I say that's a myth is because you know who the master builders are, or by history it'll tell you who the master builders are, and kind of in any generation, you know, maybe 10, possibly 5, yeah, maybe 12, you know, uh, that's across the globe. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, fine. If you're one of those 12, great. <laughs> There's an awful lot of people that go through architectural education, an awful lot of pay people are paying an enormous amount of money investing in that architectural education who ain't going to be a master builder. Yeah. And so I think, it, it, to me, uh, development was something that I kind of... Um, got to quite early on. I, I, I enjoyed. I enjoyed the mathematics. I enjoyed the financial. I enjoyed the possibility of control. Mm. And I've enjoyed that control over a period of time. I wouldn't say that control is, in reality, of course, control is different, difficult because you're only in control of it. You're not in control of it. You're kind of involved with um, every single one of those items that I gave you my narrative in my shopping, yeah. my, my shopping list. They have a person attached to them. And that's a person, whether you're paying them or not paying them, boy, you've got to have a conversation with them. Yeah. So when you say you're in control, it's kind of like you're in control if you're driving at 90 miles an hour down a motorway in the central light lane and you've lost your brakes. That's about the level of control you've got. You just have a light touch of the steering wheel hoping you're gonna, it's going to slow up when you need it to. So control but you kind of it's still kind of still if you if you can cope with that yeah you can sleep at night it's good fun <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a roller coaster <laughs> no I, do, I but quite seriously i i do think it's very um remiss of um the architectural education not to uh, not to allow people to have access to that level of skill training, and and it seems to be, um, it doesn't. It, 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 everybody wonders why it is that um, architects are kind of are, are not uh, involved in all of these other aspects of, and why other people because they're not offering the value that mm. clients are looking for, and I think that it comes down to something simple. If you say to an architect. <laughs> Oh, I've got this great idea for. Oh, no, come and see me. I want to have a new house. And the guy comes to you and says, or the girl comes to you and says, oh, I've got this, I love this site. Fantastic idea for a new house. And you say, Well, I've got a budget, you know. I, I, I've, I've put all the money together, and all I can afford is uh, 500000 for this new house. Yeah, so there's, uh, there's no problem. But I've got this brilliant. I thought we could just add that. And then, you know, then off it goes to the QS, and the QS comes back, so well, I'm sorry, this is this is a million pounds. And, and so you said, the client says, well, I told you we only had half a million. Yes, but I have this great idea. You know, so wake up. You know, a budget is a budget. It's mm. real. 
Yeah. It means that that's what the guy's got to spend. Yeah. <laughs> and don't dismiss it. Like, mm. kind of give it pay lip service. Just understand that that is, that is commercial reality. Yeah. Now, you may have a... If you say, okay, I've got a scheme here for half a million pounds as your budget. I've got another scheme for a million quid that you haven't got, but I think it can give you that much more value. Then at least you're kind of starting to engage in, in a real conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I was interested. I was, I was chatting to an insurers recently and they were talking about the majority of claims that they end up dealing with with, with architects is normally about this kind of miscommunication and ob- obviously this kind of lack of financial literacy with the, with the project and it becomes like a, a sort of deep, deeply embedded communication problem between the client and the architect. Yeah. And, you know, quite serious rifts can happen and it's unpleasant for... A well, lot I think it, I, I, I always I use this analogy, which is, a, which is an, I think, an interesting one, which is to say that actually... Throughout history, I mean, really, we're now going back through throughout the whole of history. I don't think you can tell me of a single building that didn't cost money. Yeah. It doesn't matter, okay, it doesn't matter if the pharaohs were doing it, it doesn't matter if it was the church was building it, it doesn't matter if the Duke of Westmoreland was building it, it cost money. Mm. It was resources, right? This is not like somebody making a painting and the only cost they've got is to some high quality oil paints and a canvas yeah this is this is stone and bricks and mortar and and uh, skills and, and trades labor, yeah. and labor and everything else so in that na- in in the nature of making buildings you are involved in resource mm. if you're involved in resource why on earth aren't you treating that as part of your own kind of understanding and mm. why do you put that to one side why why do we live this kind of mytholo- mythological life that we say oh i don't want to know about that it's kind of somehow you know dirtying my kind of creative <laughs> endeavor well if that's the way you think fine but i don't believe that to be an intelligent response yeah yeah and it has it has an impact on the industry as a whole and Absolutely. Ca- and then kind of you know clients are you know and you know they're, they're suspicious of the professional. Well, you're not, you're not, allowed, I mean, what a, a client is coming to his architect and giving, I mean, when we work with our architects, we put huge amount of trust in them. Mm. They still have a very important part in that development process mm. because they're imagining what it is that the building can be and they're then trusted and, and respected throughout the whole element. And it is essential to us that they understand our motivation in this. Mm. Of course, our motivation is to make better buildings. That's why we do it. But at the same time, I have shareholders, I have funders. I have to ensure that that project is going to be firmly based and if it, whatever money it needs, I've got to know that at the end, I'm going to have that money to pay it. Otherwise, the whole thing is going to go pear-shaped. Mm. So I think it's it's kind of weird and no, no longer relevant to any part of our current uh, wider economic society for us to abrogate ourselves as architects yeah. from the notion of the business of architecture. And the yeah. notion of the business of architecture is the notion of the cost and value of the buildings that we're making. Yeah, totally. No, very much, very much agree with that. Um, I think that's I think that's everything really that's what, that's Good. absolutely fantastic and again just loads and loads of wisdom and experience there so thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me again I've enjoyed it. cheers so that is a wrap thank you for listening the views expressed on this show by my guest do not represent those of the host and I make no representation promise guarantee pledge warranty contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable <laughs>